Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to ask everyone to move forward. The people in the back, if you wouldn't mind coming a little bit more forward, the, for the family to feel a little bit more entouré, comme on dit ici. Just a, thank you so much. Shilamalot Shemesh, <laughs> 
Adonai Ishmor Tzeitecha Uvoecha Meata Mizmorle David, Adonai Rawi lo exar, Bino deshe yarbitseni, Alme menucho hod ye nahaleni, Nafshi yeshovev, Yan chen vemagle tzedek, Leman shemo, Gam kile fegeit salmavet, Lo iraha raha, Ki atahi madihi, Shivtecha umishantecha, heima yenachamuni. Taroch lefanai shulchan, neget sorarai. Dishanta vashem en roshi, kosi rivaya. Ach tova chesed yirdefuni, kol yame chayai. Vishapti bevet adonai. The Lord is my shepherd, that's relationship. I shall not want, that's supply. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, that's rest. He leadeth me beside the still waters, that's refreshment. He restoreth my soul, that's healing. He guideth me in straight paths, that's direction, for his name's sake, that's purpose. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that's testing, I will fear no evil, that's protection. For thou art with me, that's faithfulness. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, that's discipline. Thou preparest a table before me, in the presence of mine enemies, that's hope. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, that's consecration. My cup runneth over, that's abundance. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, that's blessing. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord, that's security, forever, that is eternity. Mirtam le David, shomreni hei le ki chasiti vach. Amar tel Adonai, Adonai ata, tovati bala lecha. Lig doshim asher bar etzema veadirei kol echef etzivam yirbu atzebotam acher maharu bal asich niskeihem midam uval esayet shemotam al sefatai. Adonai, menad echel ki vechosi, ata tomich gorali, chavalim naflu li ban imim, af nachalat shofra alai. Avarech et Adonai asher hiatsani afleilot Yisaruni chil hiotai Shiviti Adonai lenegdi tamid Ki mimini baal emot Lachere na samach libi via gele kebodi 
Afe besari ishkon lavetach ki lo tazov nafshi lishod lo titen chasir chalirod shachat todi ni orach chaim sova semachot et panecha. Neymot Liminecha Netza Ashrei ha'ish asher lo halak v'atzad v'shaib U'v'derech ha'tayim lo amad Uvamoshav leitzim lo yashav. Ki im v'torat arnoi chevtso, uvatorato yege yomam valayla. Vehayaki eit shatul al palge maim, asher pirio yitain veito, vealeha lo yibol, vechol asher yase yatsliach. Lochein har shaim, ki im kamotz. Asher tid fenu ruach. Al kein lo yakumu rishoim ba mishpat, vechataim ba dat tzadikim. Ki yodea adonai derech tzadikim, vederech rishoim. Tovet. Mizmora David, Adonai mi agur be'alecha, mi yishkon behar ha'kodeshecha, holech tamim efoar ha'tzedek, vedover emet bilavavo, lo ragal al leshono, lo asa l'reu ra'a, vecherpa lo nasa al kerovo. Nivzeb einav nimas, vet yirvei Adonai yechabed, nishba lehara velo yamir. Kaspo lo natan beneshech, veshochad al naki lo lakach. Oseh le lo imot leolah. Lord, who shall sojourn in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell upon thy holy mountain? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh truth in his heart, that hath no slander upon his tongue, nor doeth evil to his fellow, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not, he that putteth not out his money on interest, nor taketh a bribe against the innocent, he that does these things shall never be moved.
Please rise. You may be seated. We'll now invite the family, Tear and Kriya, to come forward in front of the casket to tear the garments.
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Dear family, and dear friends, we gather today to honor the memory and mourn the loss of Rabbi Dr. Wilfred Shushet, Morenu Harav Zev Ben Meir Ubraina, the spiritual leader of this congregation from 1946 to 1993, and Rabbi Emeritus for the past 25 years. Rabbi Shushat passed away on the 20th of Tevet in his 99th year due to a brief illness. Husband of the late Miriam passed away in 2012. Beloved father and father-in-law of Margola Shushat, Elizabeth Schwartz of blessed memory, her husband Rabbi Yaakov Schwartz, Bernard Raphael Shushat, Bryna and Joshua Landis. Cherished grandfather of Ayala Schwartz, Ariel, Eli, and Daniel Landis. Dear brother and brother-in-law of Rita and the late Colonel Bernard J. Feinstone, Charles and Muriel Shushat, the late Seymour and the late Joan Shushat, and brother-in-law of Mary and the late Marvin Socket and the late Bernard Socket. We gather today in sadness in this sanctuary, in this sacred space, where our beloved Rabbi Shushet led, inspired, prayed, conducted a spiritual life of such dignity and devotion 
for over 70 years. We mourn the passing of our spiritual leader, a man so wholly devoted to his family, of a Jew of deep faith and profound integrity, of a gentle and kind man whose presence will be missed by our bereaved Shar Shemaim community, by his family, and by the very many, as the rabbi would say, who suffer today from the pangs of bereavement. We'll now call upon his family to offer words of eulogy and memory and tribute. We'll hear from Eli, followed by Josh, and Margola, Bryna, and Rafi. I am also representing my siblings, Ariel and Daniel, with these words. My grandfather truly was one of the most outstanding, understanding, and impressive people I've ever met. He touched thousands with his ser thoughtful sermons, and unlike any other rabbi that I know of, he wrote his sermons in his sleep. He would fall asleep so deep in thought and would wake up with the sermon. And these weren't just any ordinary sermons that rabbis give. No, no offense. They were unlike any others. He had a powerful voice that would project across any room of any size filled with however many people. He always made it his mission to let the back row hear what he had to say, and everyone would listen. Going into my 18th year of life, I've never experienced such a presence on the bima. In his last few days of life, his biggest concern was missing Shul. Even at 98 years old, my grandfather was always the first one in Shul ready to daven. No one was more dedicated to the people around them than my grandfather. He was truly selfless, and he always put others before himself. He would never complain, no matter the severity of his discomfort, because he never wanted to be a burden on anyone. It was such a privilege to have such a close, meaningful relationship with my grandfather. And from him, I've learned so many valuable lessons that will always apply to my life going forward. I miss him so much. I wish he were around longer to teach me more but I'll have to work with what I have. May he rest in peace with Hashem forever. Thank you. On February 7th, 1993, I called Rabbi Wilfred Chushat to ask him for his permission to marry his daughter. What did Bryna say, Josh? <laughs> she said yes. Great, then I say yes. It has been my great honor to be my father-in-law's son-in-law. We never exchanged a cross word. He and Miriam, Zichonali Racha, like my own parents, were the warmest, 
and most inviting. They were wise and unobtrusive. I felt through action my father-in-law's selfless love, as did Bryna, Margola, Rafi, and Liz Zichonali Vracha. Dad loved and respected his Shar family too. You have all been there for him and all of us, his family. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank Bryna, Rafi, and Margola for their exceptional devotion to Dad. Thank you, Aunt Rita. Thank you, Elliot, Cheryl, Jen, and Joni Shushat for almost every Erev Shabbat being with Dad and more. Rabbi Shushat's caregivers in these recent years were all greatly dedicated. Thank you all. A great man with a sterling Keter Shem Tov, crown of a good name, has passed. We were all privileged to have had him in our lives. Tehei nishmato tzura b'tzror hachayim. May his soul be bound up in the bond of eternal life. Amen. We received this from my brother-in-law, Rabbi Yaakov Schwartz, and his words are, My revered father-in-law, Rabbi Shushat, Evet Hashem, Ish HaElokim, a message from Rabbi Yaakov. On behalf of my honored parents, Rabbi Albert and Gloria Schwartz, and my entire family, I would like to express our heartfelt sorrow and profound sadness over the passing of my revered father-in-law, Rabbi Wilfred Shushat father of my most beloved late wife, Elizabeth Elisheva, Zichonol Ivracha, and Saba of our wonderful daughter, Ayela Yibadel Lechayim, who is very much loved and cherished. I shall never forget the joy we shared at my wedding to Elizabeth and the joy he had holding our newborn daughter, Ayela, on the steps of our home in Oceanside, Long Island, where Elizabeth and I served as Rabbi and Rebetzin. Our deepest condolences to Brian and Josh, Rafi, the Shushat Landis families, and myself, and all of the bereaved Shar Shemaim congregation. How fitting that Rabbi Shushat's passing took place Erev Shabbat Shemot, when we read about the emergence of our greatest leader and sage, Moshe Rabbeinu. Like Moshe, Rabbi Shushat can best be described by the two appellations the Torah itself in the Book of Devarim chose to describe our greatest Torah leader, that is, Evet Hashem, servant of God, and Ish HaElokim, inspirational angel of God. Like Moshe Rabbeinu, Rabbi Shushat can be described as an Evet Hashem, a selfless servant of Hashem. He knew no personal agenda or self-interest. He asked little or nothing for himself and gave away generously and without question or complaint his time and whatever resources he had so painstakingly earned to the poor and to those in distress. He never looked to miss a minyan, shiva, or davening service. His constant presence was a near tamid, an undying flame that by its powerful essence soothed and healed and provided strength and a bedrock of faith, even in times of tragedy. He revered the Torah and the rabbinic tradition and sought no innovation or departure from its laws and standards. But he was Ish HaElokim, Lifnei Moto, who until the end of his life 
was a fiery and passionate expositor of Torah. Despite the tragic personal loss of his beloved wife, Miriam, and Elizabeth, and the challenges of near-legal blindness, the light of Torah and Midrash issued from him. In the form, his magnificent translations of rabbinic Midrash Bereshit that he so beautifully elucidated. Like Moshe, he was inspired to serve the Jewish people from his earliest experience. He shone from all the youth of his historic congregation and was handpicked by his distinguished predecessor to lead the next generation of this congregation into a new era, a role he played for over seven decades. Mere words cannot capture this giant of ethics and spirit, but we can try to remember and emulate his ways, his strength, his devotion, and the selfless love he gave us. And may he be a source of blessing and protection to his family, his congregation, and to Klai Yisrael. My father would always say that the most important part of giving a speech is that the audience must be able to hear you. He was a masterful orator and won the homiletics prize in rabbinical school, but felt that if people said to him, Rabbi, I heard you, now that was an achievement. He developed his booming voice, which stayed with him to the end. It is unfathomable to me that I'm standing on this pulpit that he had made holy for so long. I've been fortunate to be able to have many opportunities to speak about him over the years, when he's honored by Israel Bonds, when he was the Chatan Torah, at his 50th and 60th anniversaries at the Shar, and each time he said to me, Bryna, that was a wonderful speech, but it was a eulogy. I said, don't worry, that's not going to happen for a very long time. I've been blessed to have him for so many years which I was grateful for every single day. He was an enormous gift, and I was so incredibly fortunate to be a recipient of his endless capacity to give and love. We spoke every day, and each night when I called and said, Hi, Dad, it's Bryna, he would say, So wonderful to hear your voice. I'm so lucky that you keep calling me. He was the most selfless person that I'd ever met. He was completely focused on others and really had no ego whatsoever. His kindness and love for all people was evident when I took an Atlas taxi to the airport and the cab driver said to me, are you the rabbi's daughter? He is an exceptional man. All the drivers want to take him to the synagogue. His love for his family was boundless and he was completely smitten with my mother and treated her like a queen at all times. He would always say that she made him a better rabbi, a better person, and a better Jew. The devotion and love that he showed her throughout her life, and especially during her seven-year challenging illness, was awe-inspiring. Even though he was a busy rabbi devoted to a 1,600 family flock, he always had time for his family. He never missed any performance of mine or special event, and he was the one who would pick me up from school when I was sick. He would sit with me each night and listen to me recite the Shema and would give me a blessing each week on Friday over the phone, no matter where I was located at the time. He once helped me with a speech that I had to make in class about am I my brother's keeper. I was struggling how to end the talk, and he came up with the perfect line. It's not good enough to live and let live. You have to live and help live. That seemed to be his motto in life. He had a very clear moral compass. He always did the right thing, no matter how difficult. When my father had a sabbatical in Israel during the 73 war, there was a gas shortage, and the Israeli government asked everyone to choose one day when they would not drive to save on gas. Most of the people who kept Shabbat chose Saturday as their day to not drive, but my father chose Tuesday. His explanation was, why choose a day when I never drive? How is that helping? My father was a role model for our family in dealing with adversity. 
He suffered huge losses of loved ones, including his brother Seymour, his nephew Brian, my mother, and my sister Liz. Those were unbearable losses for him, but he carried on stoically. He also faced all kinds of physical challenges, but adapted to his new assisted reality with grace and dignity. His loves were shul, family, and community, and they were paramount in his life. I'd always wanted him to come move to New York to be with me, but I knew that I could not compete with the Shar. He never missed a minion unless he wasn't well, and he was usually the first one there. At the hospital, he kept saying, when do you think I'll be able to get to shul again? He loved Chazanut and was always thrilled to hear his favorite cantorial pieces. Thank you to Chazan Gideon and the choir for the beautiful performances today. Thank you to all the wonderful clergy, Rabbi Shire, Marat Rachel, Gideon Zellemeyer, Rabbi Wolfson, Broi Azale, and Yassi Evrenchen for their constant support and devotion to my father over the years. He really enjoyed being with all of you and always recounted wonderful stories about each of you to, each of you to me. I want to thank Claire Berger and the whole board. Claire brought us party sandwiches in the hospital. She picked up my brother from the airport. She was wonderful. I also want to thank the incredible staff at the Shar, led by Penny Kolb in the office and Jose DeSantos in the building for all that you did for him. I want to especially thank Tanya for the love and care she always showed my father and for cooking no salt meals for him each and every time. And the Meals on Wheels, Judy Kaplan, Aranda Herman for sending all kinds of no salt delicacies to him on a regular basis. I have to thank the wonderful Loon Lake community who he loved so much and I know who loved him. I want to thank all my father's caregivers who were there with him through thick and thin, Ron, Trevor, Lurlin, George, Efren, and Godfrey. He considered all of you his friends. We are so grateful to all of his nieces and nephews, and particularly Elliot and Cheryl, and his beloved sister Rita, for all of the constant love and huge effort that you made to be with him almost every Friday night dinner and beyond. Lastly, I want to thank all of you for always being there to support him over an incredibly long tenure at one institution. 47 years as the active rabbi, an additional 25 as rabbi emeritus for a combined 72 years at the Shar HaShemayim. On a personal note, I want to thank all of you for all the support that you've shown me and my family all of these years. You watched us grow up and were there cheering us on every step of the way, and for that we are very grateful. My children were always excited to come to the Shar and were proud of their special Saba who led this community for so long. My sadness is profound, and I know that it will be for a long time, but it gives me great comfort to know how many of you feel the same way about this gentle, scholarly, humble, loving, and giving man who was my world. Dad, I love you so much, and I will try hard to incorporate all you've taught me by example and pass that on to my children because, Dad, I heard you, and I hope that you heard me. Yehi zichra baruch, may your memory be a blessing to us all. Uh, dear friends, when my uh, mother passed away, my father turned to me and said, I'm very sorry that you are now an orphan. Today, I'm not the only orphan. We're all, all, we are all orphans. <sighs> Dad was here for a whole generation. He knew you, usually your parents, sometimes your grandparents, and watched you. We lost an Abba. We lost the father of the congregation, a spiritual father today. The Talmud says, when a saintly person at Sadiq leaves town, 
פנה זיווה, פנה הודה, פנה הדרה. That a tzaddik makes an impression on the town and when they leave, the radiance and the glory and the beauty of that city seems to have vanished. What does that mean? The simple meaning is that the righteous person, the tzaddik, brings the light of wisdom and spirit and teaches us beauty and the meaning of life. So when they're gone, we feel that we are left in the dark. But I think the deeper meaning is that the righteous man teaches us to find light and beauty and joy and meaning within ourselves. by their teachings and by their example. So when they leave us, we feel alone. We're afraid we won't find it in ourselves anymore without their help and without their example. Dad was born in Montreal on June 6, 1920. He attended his Jewish education first at the Talmud Torah, which in those days was yet to be a day school. He grew up in a traditional home at the house of the Furrier Meyer Shushat, Dad so proudly would tell how his father's business would be closed every Saturday, something which was very uncommon in those days. He was the more the religious of the siblings, and his brother Seymour would joke around with him, reminding him to daven mincha every day and not to forget. He went to McGill to study psychology, where he heard a lecture from the late Professor Mordechai Kaplan. He was impressed with his ability as an orator and decided he wanted to be a rabbi and went to JTS in New York where Kaplan was teaching homiletics. Dad was very traditional. In practice, he was an Orthodox Jew, but felt that the seminary in those days was more open-minded, had great scholars, and was quite traditional, so he went there. He became close with Professor Saul Lieberman, Professor Louis Ginsburg, and later with Abraham Heschel, who wanted him to write a PhD on the writings of Yeshayo Horvich, the 16th century Kabbalist of Prague. But Dad wanted to be a congregational rabbi. Second World War was in progress, and Dad wanted to be a chaplain for the Jewish soldiers overseas. The seminary graduated him early to facilitate this, but he was turned down by the Canadian Army because he was not yet 26 years of age. He returned to New York to finish his studies. After a two-year position in Buffalo, he became the favorite of the youth by hitting a home run at the synagogue baseball team. But then he was asked by Rabbi Herman Abramowitz of Montreal to be his assistant at congregation Sha'ar HaShemaim. It was 1946 and Abramowitz was ill and passed away six months later and Dad became his successor. Dad took being a rabbi very seriously. Every sermon had to be a masterpiece. Professor Kaplan would teach him in homiletics that he said, I could teach you how to speak, but the content is up to you. Dad was a master. As Rabbi Jonathan Rosenblatt of New York told me, when my father spoke at my nephew Daniel Landis's bar mitzvah in June of 2017, he said, your father in his twilight is a better speaker than most rabbis in their prime. Dad loved the Shar and loved being a rabbi. In 1953, he was invited to the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II in Buckingham Palace. I have the invitation and the medal. He had a great admiration for the queen. Wondered if she was Jewish, maybe. But felt he was only allowed to go somewhere on Shar time if it had to do with the Montreal Jewish community or Shar members. And since the queen was not a Shar member, he didn't go. In 1954, he married my mother Miriam. She was the love of his life. He would always say to me, Rafi, don't look for the perfect woman. Your mother's already taken. He always said that marrying her made him a better man, as Bryna said. From then on, he always attended the services morning and, and night and never stopped. He had two homes, the Shar and his family, and he took them both very seriously. Most people have no idea of, of things he used to do. Morning service was at 7.30, then he ate quickly at home. He would come to the synagogue, and a barrage of people would be waiting at the door for charity. From Montreal, from New York, from Israel. Then he would meet with couples getting married, bar mitzvah boys, synagogue meetings, preparing for weddings, funerals, shiva homes in the evenings, or just to talk to somebody with a sympathetic ear. In addition, he went weekly to visit members of the community in hospitals. When my sister Elizabeth was terminally ill in California, my father told me he knew what was happening before the doctors told him because he saw that look in her eyes. For a rabbi of a wealthy congregation, he spent a lot of time with the poor and the broken. 
One time this fellow came to his office. My father was helping. He was a non-Jewish former maestro who had lost his job and was having a hard time. At the Shar, he built up program after program. His favorite was the 15 study groups at people's homes, some of which exist up to this day. He helped form the junior congregation, the third service on high holidays, the bat mitzvah classes, the sukkah dinners, weekend retreats, and the Laurentians. He founded the Montreal Board of Jewish Ministers to create dialogue between Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform. He could do this because they all respected him. At my bar mitzvah, Rabbi Harry Stern of Temple Emmanuel, the Reform congregation, danced around with Rabbi Kramer, the founder of Montreal Lubavitch. That could only happen at my father's house. He was close friends with Rabbi Denberg and Rabbi Hechman of the Vada Ir. Once after writing a letter on somebody's behalf, he kidded with them and said, why do you accept my letters? I'm a JTS graduate. They answered him, Rabbi Shushat, you can't fool us. We know you're Orthodox. He also had a close relationship with Rabbi Leib Baron of Merkaza Torah Yeshiva in Montreal and asked him to give a weekly Talmud class in Yiddish at the Shar, which lasted for over 30 years. Rabbi Barons once said that Dad not only kept the Shar traditional, but set the tone for all of the Montreal Jewish community. Dad was close with the conservative rabbis of Montreal, particularly with Rabbi Alan Langner, Rabbi Bernie LaFell, and Rabbi Maurice Cohen, with whom he met professionally and socially. In 1967, he heard that Canada's centennial year, there would be an Expo 67 with exhibits. There was a pavilion plan for the Christian faith, Dad thought, how wonderful if we had a pavilion of Judaism. Together with Sam Steinberg, they created such a pavilion which had one million visitors during the course of its standing. In the 70s, to promote kashrut in the city, he established the DeSola Club on Mountain Street. He thought the idea of a kosher club would make eating kosher more accessible and more trendy. The club was successful, but when Aaron Green, the manager, retired, there was no one to run it because, after all, Dad was a full-time rabbi. In 1973, the Shah offered him a sabbatical for the first time. Dr. Charles Solomon was then president and suggested to dad to go to Israel or else they'll keep calling you to do things here. So he went to Israel. He came back for a Shoshone Yom Kippur and the war broke out. He frantically tried to get back. After coming back to Jerusalem, he spent his days during the war driving around giving lift to soldiers who needed to, give to get to their bases or homes on leave all day long. During the course of that time, he met Professor Pinchas Peli, who had taken courses at JTF and was a seventh generation Jerusalemite who taught at Ben Gurion University and believed passionately in bridging gaps between religious and secular Jews in Israel. They created the Shabbat Riachad program, having weekend retreats for religious and secular Israelis and the Shar Israel project to bring a group from Montreal to meet the movers of Israeli society. That year I intended yeshiva for the first time, and Dad was taken by the idea of a yeshiva. In the 60s, he had fought to establish a Jewish day school at the Shar, which the board rejected. Of course, years later, the Akiba school opened here at the Shar. He encouraged me to study. I went to Orchaim Yeshiva in Toronto, then back to Israel, and he really liked that. He was both deeply religious and universal and open-minded in his thinking. His steadfast commitment to Jewish observance drew him slowly away from the new conservative movement, which was changing with the times. In 1982, the conservative movement voted in favor of women rabbis. Dad was on the committee of 16. He and one other were against for various reasons, one being that a rabbi needs to form minyanim and lead services. When the movement passed the mo motion for women chazanim without consulting the committee, he stepped down and never attended another RA convention. After that, he helped found the Union for Traditional Judaism. Just to set the, this, the record straight, by the way, Dad had a great appreciation for women scholars and was very fond of our Maharat Rachel Feingold, who he really felt was a sincere scholar, helping women feel at home in the synagogue. Just to set the record straight. Upon retiring, he wanted a traditional rabbi who was orthodox in practice and open-minded, but after retirement, he decided not to be involved in the synagogue's meetings so as not to cause problems for the new rabbis. He spent his time writing The Gate of Heaven, The History of the Shar, and four books on the Midrash, the fourth which was published recently, and the book launch was supposed to be February 18th of this year. Dad even said to me, do it even if I can't come. Dad loved life. He loved his family. 
He loved the shar. He loved davening and Jewish life in general. It reminds me of the story told by Heschel in his book, The Earth of the Lords, of a woman came to the rabbi and spoke of her son who had left Judaism and religious life to become a secular Zionist in Israel. She said, Rabbi, I know he's doing a mitzvah telling the land, but I want him to enjoy this world a bit too by being a, a, with a little Yiddishkeit. Dad loved life, loved davening, loved people, was selflessly devoted even after retirement. He used to say, I don't know why I lived so long. I did nothing special. He would also hear people saying on your side, long life to you. And he would say to me, I know this is a custom, but the reality is it's not about having a long life. It's about the quality of life. Even though dad claimed he knew not why he lived so long, I do. You see, after his retirement, dad taught us the greatest teaching of life, which is how to make the most of everything you have. He always saw the good in people without being naive. When my sister Elizabeth was struck with terminal cancer, Brian saw her for the first time in California, her eyes sunken, her stomach bloated. She started to cry, Liz, what happened to you? Dad said, what do you mean she's so beautiful? <laughs> Sorry. My mother was sick with a uh, crippling disease linked to Parkinson's and the caregivers were so moved how he daily professed his love to mom, whether she could hear or not, whether she could answer or not. People loved his sense of humor. He joked with the taxi drivers and really anybody he met all loved him, Jew and non-Jew. The Iranian owner of the Atlas Taxi Company wanted a, a yearly blessing from him and everybody liked calling him the rabbi. Even our caregivers learned to sing the Shabbat songs like Lynn. No one realized how handicapped he really was. He was legally blind because of macular degeneration and had a cataract in an eye which didn't work. He couldn't see me unless I was close to him. He could only hear from one ear and with a hearing aid. He walked slowly with a walker, had a heart condition, but that did not get him down. Life was good and one had to make the, mo the most of it. His kindness and spirit moved all who knew him. This lesson in his elderly years was the most inspiring of all his teachings. The doorman had 200 lands down. A Roman Catholic, um, an Orthodox, excuse me, Orthodox uh, uh, Christian from Greece told me, Rabbi Shushat taught me optimism, and it's made me a stronger man. While in the rehab facility during the during past Hanukkah, Dad had a Jewish roommate who joined us for candle lighting and Yiddish songs. Dad was so moved when his new friend said that now he feels he has to embrace Jewish life more. Reaching out was so important to him, and so were people. The Shah was his family. He loved this shul, and he loved all of you. In the rehab, he, all he could think of was when I'm coming back to shul again. In the ICU, he fought like a lion for life. A day before his departure, he was able to formulate a few words. He said, Rafi, how bad is it? I said, the doctors are still optimistic. On Thursday, things changed. I told him that it's only 50-50 and that Rabboni Shalom, God will have to decide at this point. And I could see him preparing himself for what may come. There are many wonderful things to say about Dad. I'm privileged to have been his son, and I'm still his son. He taught us all he met how to find radiance, glory, and beauty in life. Panaziva, panahoda, panahadara. Thank you, Dad. We all miss you. You're in our thoughts and our hearts forever. I'd like to end by a poem. I call it the rock because we all we saw dad as the rock, the stable one. He walks to the synagogue and nothing stands in his way. Winds blow at his overcoat, but he fastens the buttons tightly. Snow falls on his head, but he's wearing a cap. Ice cold wind hits his face, but he has a scarf. Slush threatens his feet, but he has overshoes. Nothing stands in his way. There is only man, God, and duty. Duty to God, duty to family, duty to love, duty to community, duty to the congregants, duty to the Jewish people, duty to mankind. A Jobian wind attacks him anew. I will smite his daughter in cruel malaise, but he comforts her in her illness and builds a memorial and treks on. I will dim his eyes, but he treks on following a dim path. I will deafen his ears, but he treks on in, with hearing aids. I will break his hip and distort his gait, but he treks on with his trusty walker. 
I will beat and plague the life of his, love of his life with severe illness. But he cares for her, never leaving her side, declaring his love for her day in, day out. I will steal her from him. But he vows to trek on in her memory and pray for her soul every day. I will break his bones and force him to stop. But he patiently awaits divine healing. And day after day, week after week, until it arrives. I give up, says the wind. He is too much. No, says a hidden voice. He is a rock. People hurt him, but he forgives. People take advantage, but he takes pity. Others break and dominate, but he rebuilds and comforts. He is the rock. Thirty-six in each generation. They are the foundation stones of our people. They come and they go, but no natural force decides their fate. Only he who resides above the ultimate rock of Israel. But when the ultimate rock of Israel summoned him, Rabbi Shushet bowed humbly to the divine decree on the 20th of Tevet 5779. May his memory be a blessing. I share a memory of, of a birthday party that took place a number of years ago in, in honor of a member of our congregation who had, who had achieved a, a very advanced age. Rabbi Shushat was there. He had known this individual for many years, many decades. And he offered a toast. And he said that the reason for this special celebration is not not because of age. A birthday, after all, is simply a number. Rather, he said, we celebrate all that this person has accomplished in those years. We're not celebrating how old you are, he said. We're celebrating you. He said this as he was 96 years old. And he knew of what he spoke. Rabbi Shusha was blessed with a long life. We were all blessed to have him in our lives for, for so many years. And as he said, the blessing of his longevity was not simply living. It was living his life, a life of such great impact, a life in which he continued to give, to serve, to honor the faith that was so important to him. And it would take hours for us to enumerate the ways in which he grew and impacted this community, from the home study groups, Expo 67, founding the Montreal Board of Jewish Ministers, to the lectureships and programs for which he was the prime inspiration and organizer. And we'll continue to hear of and honor these aspects of his legacy in the weeks and months ahead. Similarly, it would take hours to, to speak of the ways in which Rabbi Shushat established the values of this community. His, his passion for Israel, his fidelity to Jewish law, his love of learning, his unwavering commitment to the rituals of this congregation. So often, he was, as Rafi said, that rock, stability. In times of uncertainty, I often think of of his role as a, young, as a young rabbi, a leader of this prominent congregation in the first years of his leadership during the War of Independence, during the establishment of, of the State of Israel. We've heard so many times over the years people recall the words he said, his encouragement, his optimistic faith during the Six-Day War, the Yom Kippur War, times of local political instability. Whenever people look to this pulpit for comfort, and for meaning. It was Rabbi Shushat's powerful voice, his gentle manner, his unflinching stability that anchored this community. And while we remember his role in shaping and growing this community, he not only wrote the history of the Shar, he, he crafted it. 
We remember a man of great kindness and humility. At his core, he was an outstanding and decent person whose soul found solace in, in sanctity. He reveled in sitting and learning, in writing and praying, in being in shul, surrounded by friends, surrounded by family. His life was so intricately connected to the religious life of this congregation. Prayer was his lifeline, the words of the Sidur, his oxygen. And yet as he spent his days engaged in spiritual and serious pursuit, Rabbi Shushat never took himself too seriously. He had this wonderful and often self-deprecating sense of humor. In the last few years, when someone would ask him how he was doing, he would always say with a smile, it's better to be 21. He was so kind and loving with children. I recall that once the rabbi was sitting in a wheelchair and my young daughter and I were, were with him and Rabbi Shushat said to her, she must have been two or three years old at the time, he said, I bet your stroller is nicer than mine. And sometimes when the clergy would, would gather in the back room at Paperman's awaiting the start of a funeral, Rabbi Shushat would explain to us that the letters W.S., which were stitched into his gown, didn't stand for Wilfred Shushat. Rather, he said, W.S. stands for Wary Short. He was pure kindness, deeply sensitive. We saw this sensitivity as he, as he cared for his beloved Miriam in her years of illness. We saw this as he would be moved to, to tears by the prayers and the music that meant so much to him. We saw this sensitivity that was present in the hundreds of thousands of hours without exaggeration that he spent caring for the spiritual and emotional needs of this community. It was on the final Shabbat of his life that we read in the Torah portion of the last days and the death of, of the great patriarch, the leader Yaakov. We read as, as the patriarch blessed his family, he gave a special blessing to his grandchildren. How meaningful that this Torah portion, the last one of Rabbi Shushat's life, was also Eli's bar mitzvah parsha five years ago. As Rabbi Shushat stood here and, and blessed the next generations of his family, Hamalach HaGoel Oti. And as the rabbi loved Midrash, I'll quote the Midrash in Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, that teaches that prior to Jacob's time, people would simply live their lives, maintain perfect health until the end, and then simply pass away without warning. And the Midrash says, Ad Shabbat Yaakov Avinu Bikesh Rachamim al Zot. Vamar Lifnei Akadosh Baruch Hu Ribono Shel Olam Al Tikach Et Nafshi Mimeni Ad Asher Ani Metzavet Banai Uvnei Veti. The Midrash says that this perfect health until the end of life continued until Jacob said, enough. And he prayed for a period of declining health. He said, Master of the universe, don't take my soul until I have the time to offer instruction, until I have the time to bless my children and my grandchildren. Give me time. Give me warning so that I can pass on these values. And I often thought of this teaching in the years that I was privileged to observe Rabbi Shushat, to pray next to him, to consult with him, simply to be in his presence. Every interaction, an opportunity to learn. What a blessing to learn from such a leader, a man of authentic devotion to the principles of Judaism, a scholar so kind and so decent, a rabbi who brought so much dignity to his profession and to his community. Lech b'shalom. Go in peace, dear Rabbi Shushat. As you taught so many times, 
Lo alecha hamlacha ligmor. The work is not yours to complete. Velo atavin chorin lihibatel mimena. And you did not for one moment desist from the holy mission that was your life's pursuit. Your family, your Shar family, will miss you greatly. I'll close with the words that were so meaningful to Rabbi Shushat and so meaningful to the, to the many who were comforted as he was, would recite these words from the prayer, Adon Olam. Biado afkid ruchi. Into his hand I commit my spirit. Be'eti shan va'aira. When I sleep, the sleep of death, and rise up to eternal life. Vi'im ruchi gaviati, and with my spirit, my body also. Adonai li, velo ira. The Lord is with me, and I shall not fear. Amen. Please rise for the memorial prayer.
Almighty, Grand Rabbi Dr. Wilfred Shushat, Moreno Harav Zeev ben Meir Ubrina, his place in paradise. May his memory be a blessing for all those whose lives he touched. May he rest in peace and let us say, Amen. The Shiva will be observed at his home, 200 Lansdowne Apartment 101. Morning services will take place at 7.20 a.m. and afternoon and evening services will commence at 4 p.m. The burial will take place at the congregation Shar HaShemayim Cemetery. At this time, as we begin, as we escort the casket out of the sanctuary, we'll invite guest clergy to join the Shar clergy at the front of the procession, followed by the president and past presidents of the congregation who will serve as honorary pallbearers. We'll also invite officers of the congregation to follow the family in the procession. Will the pallbearers please step forward? <laughs> 